anything like that. Okay, so Beowulf picking up with what's called Fit 2. The, the manuscript is divided into fits. Okay. Two, three, four, up through, I can't remember how many, 40 something, and part of the problem is one of them is misnumbered. Um, 43. Yeah, 43, but should only be 42, because I think one is either misnumbered or not numbered. Anyways, fit two. So, we left off, Hrothgall has a great, oh, Hrothgall. Had food poisoning over the weekend and it still has not It's fried my brain. Um, Hrothgar has had the grand opening of Herat, and we're told, you know, while they're announcing it, cutting the red tape, the narrator essentially says, meanwhile, a few years from now, these things are all going to burn down to the ground. Why? Because of hatred between in-laws. Okay? And then we hear the show, sing the song of creation. I like to think, possibly Cadman's him. Okay? And the poet tells us, Grindel doesn't like the song. <laughs> and who Grindel is and who he's descended from. And that Grindel is in a feud with God. Why? Because Cain started the feud. So, Fit 2 opens, beginning with line 115. Now, everything before, I should have pointed this out, the first 52 lines are often considered to be prologue. The poem doesn't begin with the number 1 for Fit 1. The first 52 lines are before that. Okay? Then you get Fit 1, now Fit 2. When night descended, he went to seek out the high house to see how the ring Danes had bedded down after their beer drinking. Okay. Who's the he? Grindel. Grindel. Okay. So, notice, when Grindel comes to Herod, nighttime. Nighttime. After what? After the feasting, after the party, after the... Specifically, after the Old English is Berthea, okay? Beer drinking is literally it. So after the danger, what? Trespass. These are Germans, folks. Think Germans and beer. Drunk. Okay, they are... You use whatever phrase you want. Three sheets to the wind, dead to the world, splashed. What? Hangover. Huh? No, it's not hungover because that's the next morning. Wasted. Wasted. That would be a good translation. After the deeds are wasted. Okay. He found therein a troop of nobles asleep after the feast. They knew no sorrow or human misery. Why did they know no sorrow or human misery? Wasted. Okay. Too drunk to be aware. Okay, now it's literally they knew no sorrow. Why? Because they're asleep. When you're asleep, you don't feel sorrowful or miserious. What if you have a night? In misery. Okay, that's different though. I mean, it's not, but they're going to shortly. Okay? Yeah, because the unholy creature, the old English there is unholy wheat, or unhallow. Wicht, white, W-I-G-H-T, okay? The, unho the unholy creature, um, grim and ravenous, was ready at once, ruthless and cruel, and took from their rest 30 things. God tells you about things. Thence he went rejoicing in his booty back to his home. His booty, his reward, his ill-gotten gains, so to speak. So he takes 30 men and goes back home. To seek out his abode with his fill of slaughter. So what did he do with the 30 men? He killed them. He ate them. So he did kill them in the process. He ate them. So how big must Grindel be if he can eat 30 men? We don't even have 30 people in this room. He's got to be pretty, pretty large. All right? So he goes back with his fill of slaughter. When in the dim twilight, just before dawn, Grindel's warfare 
was made known to men, then what? They sing songs of lamentation. A lament was lifted up after the feasting, a great mourning sound. And your gloss, or the word, mourn, why? Because it is in the morning. But that's a pun also on M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. Unhappy sat the mighty Lord, long good nobleman. That's Hrothgar. Hrothgar hears the news, and what's he do? He sits down unhappily. Is there somebody in the door? Yeah, I have you on He sits down and does what? He suffered greatly, grieved for his things. Once they beheld that hostile one's tracks, the accursed spirit, that strife was too strong, loathsome, and long. Well, how long was it? Not no long wait. For the very next night, he committed a greater murder, more not at all for his feuds and sins. He was too fixed in them. Okay? Then it was easy to find a thane who sought his rest elsewhere farther away. Then some of the things start getting smart and saying, Hera, no, over here, yes. When they pointed out, truly announced with clear tokens, that all things hate. He who escaped the fiend held himself afterwards farther away and safer. It's kind of like, you know, one night they sleep in the building next door, the next night, the building next to that, the next night. And we're going to find out later this goes on for how long? Twelve years. Okay. So he ruled and strove against right, one against all. Until line 145, empty stood the best of houses. There's that word. You've seen translated in other places. Edom, idol, stood. It's not just that it's empty. It's that it's not fulfilling what? Its purpose. Its purpose is to be a place of revelry, a place of joy, a place of human habitation, a place of human interaction. And now it's not. Okay? And so it was for a great while, for twelve long winters, the Lord of the Shieldings suffered his grief, suffered every sort of woe, great sorrow, when the sons of men it became known. Then carried abroad in sad tales that Grindel strove along with Hrothgar, bore his hatred, sins and feuds, blah, 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 blah. Twelve years this goes on, and gradually word starts to spread. Grindel's destroyed Hera, but he hasn't literally, the hall's still there. But he's destroyed it in a sense it no longer fulfills its purpose. Okay? We're told. Line 153. Begin with 152b. He bore his hatred, sins, and feuds for many seasons, perpetual conflict. He wanted no peace with any man of the Danish army. He doesn't want to resolve their problems, in other words. Okay? nor ceased his daily hatred, nor settled with money. That is, he couldn't be bought off, and he couldn't pay the Danes off. Well, why couldn't Grendel settle with money? He doesn't have any. He lives outside human commerce. Nor did any of the counselors need to expect bright compensation from the killer's hands. That's what that means. Rothgar's counselors don't expect Grendel to come to them with an offering. Hey, sorry for murdering yeah. yourself on your money. For 12 years. For the great ravager, relentlessly stalked, a dark death shadow, lurked and struck, old and young alike, in perpetual moonlight, held the misty moors. Men do not know whither such whispering demons wander about. Now, that line, I think, is there for a specific reason. The old English poet is kind of introducing, you know, think your um, campfire ghost tale. The wind blows and it storms, and you hear the wood of the side of the walls of the building you're in every now and then rattle and shake. And your mind, your imagination goes, Is that just the wind? Or is there something out there? Right? 
mankind. Thus the foe of mankind, fearsome and solitary, often committed as many crimes, cruel humiliations. He occupied Hera, the jewel of her hall in the dark nights. And we get line 168. He saw no need to salute the throne. He scorned the treasures. He did not know their fate. Okay. Wait, it says their fate. On mine it says their love. Uh, sorry, their love. Yes, that's what it said. I misspoke. So, this is lines... Literally, actually, let's not do it literally first. Let's do Leusa's translation. Leusa says, He saw no need. to salute the throne. Okay, and I'm going to put arrows in a minute for all this. Um, he saw no need to salute the throne. He scorned the treasures. He did not no, their love. Okay? So, now let me put it literally. Back to black. Not he that gift stool, that's what it literally is. Okay? So then let me translate it. Throne to greet, address, approach, was able. Come down here. Treasures before God, nor his love knew. Literally, he, uh, he was not able, okay, because the no applies to this. Literally, he was not able to greet, address, approach that throne. Right? And then you get madam for metoda. This whole thing, treasure, this is plural, but it's usually translated singular, treasure before God, nor his love knew. This is restating this, the throne. The throne is the treasure before God. Okay? Now that's the literal translation. I should have brought in, because I completely forgot to, Tolkien's translation. Because in my opinion, Tolkien messes this up too. And this is like an ant speaking to a god, okay, in terms of Anglo-Saxon stuff. Tolkien's, you know, the master. All right? But his translation of Beowulf's not very good, in my opinion. He's not here to answer, so I, I feel free to do that. 
He was not able to approach that throne, the treasure before God, nor his love knew. The his goes back to this. So what does that mean? He's not able to approach the throne. He's unworthy of ruling. Okay. Understanding this idea that rulers are somehow divinely appointed. Now, at this point in time, you do not have the idea of the divine right of kings. But within the Christian tradition, you do have the idea that governments are appointed. Government is appointed by God. Why? Because St. Paul writes that in the book of Romans in, you know, 60 or 70 or 50 AD. So that long predates this, right? Look at your footnote here. Thus the foe, dot, 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 love. This is a much disputed passage. My reading follows a suggestion made by Fred C. Robinson in Why is Grendel's Not Greeting the Gifts to Arach Mitchell, okay? And repeated in Mitchell and Robinson's Beowulf. In other words, Fred Robinson argues against, you know, the kind of the literal translation I have here, which even if I were to finesse that, because that's very little, literal, it would be he, parentheses, Grendel, was unable to approach The throne, treasure before God, um, nor did he know his, capitalize that if you want, love. What have we heard so far fairly clearly about Grindel? He's feuding with God. He's feuding with God. In this, I mean, this passage, I mean, the reason Leuza says a much disputed passage is because this being a, this, these two lines have been interpreted a whole bunch of different ways. Okay? There's a thing that comes about a little later in the Middle Ages, some of you might have heard of it, called Occam's Razor. You might know what it is. Occam was a philosopher, Scottish dude, philosopher, who essentially came up with this idea that said the easiest solution to a problem is likely the correct solution. Okay? This is a problem. The problem is how do you interpret it? The easiest solution according to Occam's razor, is likely the most correct solution. Okay? I used to be working on a book for Beowulf, which, which I've given up. And in the process, read hundreds, if not thousands, of articles. I've got a filing cap, four-drawer filing cabinet in my office. The three top drawers, two foot deep, are all full of articles on Beowulf. If I were to stack this up, it'd be taller than I am. Okay? And I've read all of them. Very few of them will offer, I mean, there are some, offer this translation. I feel kind of comforted because probably one of the foremost Beowulf scholars in the world, a guy named Andy Orchard, after I've been arguing this for at least a few years in class, came out with a couple of books, one of them Critical Companion to Beowulf, and he makes almost the exact same argument, that this is the better reading because it's more closely aligned to the text. Okay? Let's look at it in this context. Thus the foe of mankind, fearsome and solitary, often committed his many crimes. Cruel humiliations. He occupied Herod, the jewel-adorned hall, in the dark nights. He saw no need to salute the throne. Now what does salute the throne mean? Pay respects. Or, you know. He is German, so. Or the poem is so okay, you can go on Hitler if you want. What does that mean to salute? To pay respects. To pay respects? You know, you write a letter. 
I don't know if any of you have ever actually had to write a letter before because of change in our cultures. What's the first thing? It's called the salutation. Dear so-and-so. Okay? That kind of, yeah, but how do you pay respect to a throne? You kneel. You come up, do you kneel? If it's empty, it's a freaking chair. You just kneel before it? Do you go, hello, oh, bro? <laughs> nice to see you. Bow down. Or, was not able to approach, however, because approach is a possible definition for that. <coughs> the Old English, what was the Old English? Grayton, okay, means you can't do what? If this is the throne, and it's sitting like this, that means I want to sit in the big chair. I'm Grendel. I rule the hall at night. Why do I rule the hall? I go in and kill everyone. Because nobody else is alive. I've eaten them all. And there's this big chair. Daddy's chair, so to speak. And I want to go sit in it. He gets so close to it and... Stops. Does he stop of his own free will? Is this like a vampire in the church kind of situation? I don't know. But there are situations in the Christian tradition where people are stopped from being able to do something. That is, they go up and you have your Star Trek force field. They go up and... They bounce off. They can't go any closer. Is it that kind of, he was not able to approach it? Because he knew not God's love? That is, only those who know God's love can sit in the big chair. What does it mean to know God's love? Is that because Hrothgar and God, you know, they're tight like this? Or... Is knowing God's love mean God is favoring? You know, that Ara Yabedith kind of thing? Is God favoring Hrothgar? Go back to the same. Paul, Book of Romans, government is instituted by God for protection, etc., etc. Well, Grindel is the opposite of government, right? Grindel would be anarchy at work. So, he was not, he saw no need to salute the throne. Grindel saw no need to go up and say, hello, throne. Why? Because the throne for Grindel is meaningless. That's how you would have to interpret that. Okay. He scorned the treasures. There's no word there that means scorned. I mean, you could maybe take this, and because it's negative, not able to great salute, address, approach, etc., and apply it to this. So he was not able to greet, salute, address, etc., the treasures. What treasures? The jewel adorned hall, those treasures? And the treasures of the men he ate? <laughs> he did not know their love. Who's the there? The treasures? The love behind the, giving the, the treasures? The gems? The love? That reading makes, in my opinion, absolutely no sense. It, or it makes very little sense, especially in context. I think this reading makes a lot more sense, especially given what follows. Now, here's where this gets really naughty and why I usually take so much time to cover this blankety black poem. That was deep misery to the Lord of the Danes, crushing his spirit. Many a strong man sat in secret counsel, considered advice. What would be best for the brave at heart to save themselves from the sudden attacks? So, it's misery, what? To Hrothgar, that Grindel rules the hall at night, even though he doesn't get to sit in the big seat. And we're told, many a strong man Set in secret council. The word that's used there is runes. He kind of like sat there casting his mental runes, trying to figure out, how do I solve this problem? But he does what? Keeps it to himself. Why? They don't know how to solve the problem, Grindel. 
And then we get lines 175 through lines 188. One, one seventy-five through eighty-eight, which many people think are a Christian interpolation. That is, the poem originally was written six hundred, seven hundred A.D. And then some monk, in the process of copying the poem, over the years till we get the copy that we have, around 1000 AD, some monk decides it's not Christian enough. So he's going to Jesify it. He's going to Christianize it. How? Well, at times, they offered to idols at pagan temples. They prayed aloud that the, the gloss... Soul Slayer, the devil. In the Middle Ages, the gods of the pagans were often regarded as demons in disguise. Yeah, that's because early Christian fathers of the church, or early fathers of the Christian church, said those pagan Greek and Roman gods, fallen angels. Doing what? Ooh, follow me. Leading them astray and such. Okay? So, that the soul slayer, literal Salabana, Bana, Bane, might offer assistance in the country's distress. So they offered idols to pagan temples, appealing to Satan to help them overcome their problems. Now, within the normal Judeo Christian tradition, and probably even broader than that, do you really want to appeal to Satan to help you solve your problems? No, especially if those problems involve murder in demons. No. I mean, it was Jesus himself who said, you know, a house divided itself against, the house divided against itself cannot stand. Would Beelzebub cast out demons in the name of Beelzebub? Not really. Okay? So go on. Such was their custom. That is their tradition. The hope of heathens. The actual Old English word there is heaven, heathen. What does the very use of this word imply on the part of the poet and the speaker of the poem? The poet and the speaker here are kind of conflated. They're one and the same. You can't even use the word heathen unless you're in what kind of context? Christian context. In other words, if you were off here in, let's say, this table, this desk represents heathen land. Um, Sweden in 700 AD. They never heard of Christianity in Sweden in 700 AD. Okay? Or Russia in 700 AD. Total pain. You wouldn't have, you know, Lars over here in Sweden talking to Sven and saying, you damn heathen you wouldn't mean anything. Okay? It would be like, here, let me use a racial example. It would be like a totally pale white guy in a totally pale white society talking to another totally pale white guy and saying, you whitey, you. It's like a fish calling another fish a fish. Why would you? It makes no sense. So, it's only within a Christian context that you have the term heathen. All right? So, such was their custom, the hope of heathens. That's telling us, at the very least, the author is working from a different perspective. It also might suggest that the speaker within the poem is coming from that perspective. They remembered hell in their minds. Now, hell could be Germanic. Hell. A really, really, really cold place with the goddess, hell. Okay? Not Kate Blanchett, mm -hmm. Ragnarok, all that. She's not that hot. Okay? It's just <laughs> in the cold, sin, whatever. <laughs> so, they remembered hell in their minds. They did not know the maker. 
the judge of deeds. They did not know the Lord God, or even how to praise the heavenly protector, the wielder of glory. And this is where a lot of people go, oh, for crying out loud, why'd you have to go and bring God, the, the other God, you know, the real kind of Christian like God into it. Woe unto him who must thrust his soul through wicked force in the fires of grace. See, that's not the cold hell. That's Christian hell. Or Judeo-Christian hell. That's the fires of eternity and all that kind of stuff. So, woe unto him. Every time you have a passage that begins, woe unto him, or will be it to him, what kind of verse do you have? Nomic. It's a wisdom passage. It's a proverb. Okay? Woe unto him who must thrust, thrust his soul through wicked force in the fires of grace. Notice, wicked force. He's not doing this willingly. He's not going, ooh, Satan, 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 Satan. I want to go. This is someone who against his will is being consigned to the fires of grace. Notice it doesn't end there. Because we get another two half lines. Expect no comfort, no change at all. And it's because of these two half lines that I think this whole passage is not an interpolation. Because this idea of expecting no comfort, no way to change at all, this idea of transformation, of change, and expecting change is central to the poem. Okay, so those who don't expect any change, those who expect no comfort, they will suffer forced fires and breaks. It shall be well for him who can seek the Lord after his death day and find security in the Father's embrace. Most important word in that two and a half lines is what? After. Nope. After. Close. Bingo. It's after. It's that particular adverb slash preposition. Because when does it indicate the person is seeking God. After death. Today, you know, Baptists, old-time Baptists, have a phrase, or used to have a phrase, I don't know if they still use it. What's the rest? Turn and burn. Yeah. Turn or burn? <laughs> Middle Tennessee Baptist Church, when they were, was, used to be across the street, what's now Graduate Studies and Human Resources, they used to have their bus parked out there. And, it had, you know, the bus was red. It had golden flames. And it, you know, had written on the side, pulling souls out of hell one at a time. <laughs> okay. I'm not knocking back this. I'm just, I'm knocking this bus. I mean, you have to admit, that's some good marketing. Because what is that? Is it really? Uh, no. <laughs> what does that imply about the natural state of a human soul? It's damned. It's in hell. And so what's the job of the good rider of the Baptist bus? Pull those souls out of hell. At least Jonathan Edwards in his great sermon, I don't consider him great, but um, sinners in the hands of angry God. Where are those sinners? They're hanging over hell, but they're not there yet. They're still there. Holding them up. Okay? The bus implies, nope, you're already down there and someone's got to throw you a lifeline to pull you out. That's not even the attitude necessarily of the medieval church. With some qualifications. It is the reason why you had to be baptized pretty soon. Because the medieval Catholic church did teach. If you were a baby and weren't baptized, you did go to hell. But hell was not all fire and brimstone. There was a place of hell that was more, you know, just kind of boring. 
like mid August, you know, just you know, kind of warm. They, uh, and, oh. I think they got some uh, pagan influence as well because you know. Well, it could be. Yeah. But if you've read Dante, Dante's Divine Comedy, you know, Dante has what? He has the outer circle, the anti before hell. And that's where the good pagans go, and that's where the little babies go. It's, you got to really do something bad. And the bad there could be you lie, you cheat, you call your father, mother, sister, brother a bad name, etc. That'll get you into one of the circles. Okay? So, it shall be well for him who can seek the Lord after his death day. It's not true. According to this thinking. Now, even without the Turner Burn idea, the vast majority of the Christian tradition today, or branches of Christianity today, would say what? You've got to quote unquote make your decision for Jesus before you die. Because once you die, But there were some fathers of the early church who said, you know what? Some people will die, and that's when they will decide. Because they will realize then. Not because they live horrible lives. Okay? But because they will see the truth. And they especially applied that, for example, to people who never had any experience of Christianity. That is our people within the world of this poem. Hrothgar has never met a Christian. Beowulf has never met a Christian. They haven't had any Christian missionaries come to them. We know that to be, quote unquote, historically true. Why? Christianity hadn't reached Denmark in 520 AD when he like died. It had reached England. In fact, Christianity had reached England in the very century that Christ died. There were Celtic Christians long before Roman Christianity entered in 597. So, to seek the Lord after his death day and find security in the Father's embrace. Notice what that is contingent, contingent upon. That person who seeks the Father after his death day is expecting what? What the other person is not. Change. Comfort. Okay? Go back to the one who goes in the fire's embrace. He will expect no comfort, no way to change at all. So the person who says, there's no hope for me, there is no way to change, is essentially saying what? Sorry, God, you made a rock too big that not even you can move. My problems are too great. This is the way it's always been. And because this is the way it's always been, this is the way it will always be. Now, it seems to me, the poet, and I think Tolkien is right, it's definitely a Christian poet who's looking back on a pre-Christian time. It seems to me the poet is saying, at, le at the very least, this, as bad as it is, and as bad as it may get, cue the stupid, saccharine, syrupy song from Little Orphan Annie. The sun will always rise tomorrow. Where there's what? Where there's a will, there's a way. But what must there be before there's a will? Where there's life. If you ain't dead yet, it can always get better. But if it's really bad and you off yourself, <laughs> it's not, yeah, should I do this? Oh, man, I really shouldn't. I am going to. <laughs> earlier this year and I don't care what you think about this guy it doesn't, that part doesn't matter but at this, this little story I'm going to tell your response to what he says ought to be damn that smart Jordan Peterson had a um, one of his talks for his book uh, 12 things to know or 12 things to do or 
whatever it is. Twelve rules everybody should follow, something like that. He, you know, he's, man, he's been doing talks around the world. He has made a bazillion dollars off of this thing. Um, he's a clinical psychologist from Toronto, Canada. He's doing a talk in Indianapolis. And these things are sold out wherever he, wherever he gives them. I, I don't know. Several million YouTube followers and all this kind of stuff. Anyways, he was doing this talk in um, Indianapolis. And this woman tweeted about it afterwards. And she said, you know, he, he gave his talk. And then he had a, a, a group of people that got to meet with him afterwards. These were people who shelled out more money. Okay. And this in the talk, or at the end of the talk, he always takes questions and answers. And one of the first questions, he, he gets the question, he's, he's got his laptop. People got to email them. He gets the question, and he apparently paused. And I think she said he pulled out a handkerchief and wiped his face. And he said to the audience, I don't know that I should address this one. And his, and his voice just kind of, he's got a, kind of a high voice. And his voice just dropped. And she said, 3,000 people in this theater. And it was like, you could, the proverbial pin drop. He said, I'm going to. And he read the question. I get chills whenever I think about this. Dr. Peterson, I'm going to kill myself next week. Why should I not? You're one of 3,000 people, and you hear that question being asked. And there's a guy sitting up on the stage. Okay, what does that question assume that you take it seriously? Okay, And assume that the person asking the question really wants an answer. What does that tell you about the possibility of the answer? And... So, put yourself in Jordan Peterson's shoes. <laughs> you have, theoretically, within your hands, the possibility of saving this person's life. Not literally in that you're going to pull them, somebody drowning out of a creek or something. And she said, you know, he read the question, and there were, <gasps> and he just paused for a while. Close to five minutes. And he said, I would try a few things. One, why the rush? Or it might not have been tomorrow. That might not have been, it wasn't next week. He was like, I'm going to kill myself tomorrow. And he said, why the rush? Put it off till next week. And notice, he didn't say, no, no, no. Don't. Jesus loves you. Don't kill yourself. Or there are people who love you. Don't kill yourself. Because everybody who's contemplated suicide, guess what? They think about that. I'm not going to commit a suicide. They think about those things. He says, wait till next week. And then he said, something to the effect of, have you talked to anyone? A family member, an ad a religious advisor of some sort. Have you talked to a psychologist? Have you been to the hospital? You might want to consider that. Because what you are going through right now might be, I'm not saying it is, this is all part of his response, might be because there are things going on in your body that are totally beyond your control that you have absolutely no say over, chemical imbalances. And you know what? There are magic pills you can take that restore those chemical balances. And you've, if you get on a prescribed medication, you might suddenly discover, you know, life's not so bad. But he also said, and if you talk to people, you might also discover what? Yes, indeed, you are loved. And have you thought about killing yourself 
what it will do to those who love you, not who you love, but those who love you. And then he went on and did, the, it wasn't very long. His response was like three or four minutes. And then at the end of that, that was with everybody. There. Then they had the individual were like 20 or 30 people out of the 3,000 got to come to talk to him. And they sat around like a little semicircle. And one of the people said, um, that was my question. And everybody else just <laughs> backed it off on this one, man. And he said, okay. He said, I want you to know. I'm not going to do it. I get choked up every time I think about this. And he said, you know, I haven't told anybody. I haven't talked to anybody about it. He said, you know, you just saved my life because I will. And then the lady who's tweeting about this afterwards, she said, you know, I got his... Um, it was either his Twitter name or it might have been his email. And they started tweeting back and forth, started communicating back and forth. And she said, um, do you mind if I put this up? And he goes, no. In fact, I think it would be good. Okay? He had reached what point? Nothing could get any better. Nothing. He had decided, my life is shit. And tomorrow... That pile will be bigger and darker than it was today, and the day after that will be even worse. And Jordan Peterson essentially said what? You don't know that. It could improve. Okay? That's what the poet is getting about here. Because what were we told just earlier about Hrothgar? Twelve long years. This has been going on. And what does he think? When he gets up on the 12th year and one day anniversary. <laughs> Yesterday, today, tomorrow. Okay? With the sorrows of that time, the son of Hafdain seethed constantly. Seethed. What does that verb mean? It boils. He can never... Get this out of his mind. We saw it, right? With the wanderer. Hrothgar goes to sleep. Worried. Just overcome with despair. And he wakes up the same way. Nor could the wise hero turn aside his woe. Turn aside means what? Nope. It's not. Louder. Not ignore or forget. He couldn't change it. He's in what position? Life will never get any better. This is how it will be all the time. Too great was the strife, long and loathsome, which befell that nation, violent, grim, cruel, greatest of night evils. That's telling us Hrothgar and the entire nation are in which person's shoes? From 175 to 188. Woe to the man who expects no comfort, who doesn't expect any change at all. Why? Because he must, through force, expect the fire's embrace. Some, Christian tradition, can't speak to any others, have said hell is what? A blazing inferno? Nope. It's this. It's this. This is hell. To not ever expect a crappy life to ever get better. Most of the church fathers, most of Christian tradition, contra, you know, the popular mythology, hell is not a place at all. It's a perspective. What's the perspective? Being in the presence of God when you don't want to be. <laughs> If you're in the presence of God and you don't want to be, that's what? That's hell. That's burning. Why? Because God is an all-consuming fire. What does God, God's fire all consume? Imperfection. Dirt. 
sin right. And if you're constantly saying, you are not real, that's an imperfection. Whereas for those who quote unquote love God, it's what? It's the Father's loving embrace. Where's Rothgar? He doesn't know God. Not the Christian God, at least. And he doesn't expect anything to change. That's darkness. Then, from his home, the thane of Hirak, what? Heard of the deep problem. Why is this part not considered an interpolation? Seems to me, if you're going to consider this an interpolation, then you've got to consider this an interpola interpolation too. Why? Because Beowulf is going to be described as what? Bingo. He ain't Jesus. Don't get it wrong. He's not a Christian. Don't get it wrong. Okay? But he's but a good he, man. But he's what? A good man. He's a good man. He's The way I like to put it, he's the Anglo-Saxon mythological Superman. Because <laughs> keep in mind, Superman isn't a Christian either. Even though you do get the, hey, I'm sending my son down to these people. I mean, it's very, that one film was very. So what does Beowulf do? He heard of Grendel's deeds. And he, Beowulf, was of mankind the strongest of might in those days of life. Noble, mighty. So he orders a boat to be made. He chooses out the men that are going to go fight with him. The boldest companions, we're told. They get on their boat, they go across the ocean, they land on the Shielding's shore, and 227, they thanked God that the sea paths had been smooth for them. Now, the word there for God is God. It's literal God. It's one of the instances where it's not metode or creator, shipping, etc., etc. Okay? And then the, the Coast Guard, the watchman, sees them. And he stands up there and he sees them approach. He sees them get off their boat. And notice, are, are they just dressed in kind of wanderer's clothing? They're armed to the teeth, man. And he says, what are you warriors in armor, 237, wearing coats of mail who have come thus sailing over the sea road in a tall ship, hither over the way? Long have I been, blah, 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 blah. Never before had people openly landed on this seashore, armed like you. Long and short of his speech, who the hell do you think you are? I mean, this is like an invasion. Okay, it's a small invasion force, but it's, you know, maybe they're spies. So, he says... I need to know who you are, because one of you, 247, I have never seen a greater earl on earth than that one among you. Okay, I have never seen a greater earl on earth. Who does that have to include? Hrothgar. In other words, that, that one of you in the middle? You are the epitome of a warrior. And Beowulf is usually kind of thought of as he stands head and shoulders above everybody else. You know, he's like Arnold Schwarzenegger in his prime. He's just ripped with muscle. Why? What have we been told about him? He's the strongest of any men on earth. How strong is he? He has the strength of 30 men in each hand grip. That's the strength of 60 men. Well, what does Grindel do seemingly every night? He eats 30 men. This is like his Wheaties. Okay? So, the eldest one answered. The eldest one is Beowulf. Notice he doesn't go, hi, my name's Beowulf. He says, uh, we're men of the Gaetish nation. He elects hard companions. My father was well known among men, a noble commander named Edgedale. That's a way of saying, everybody knew who my father was, Edgedale. Give me a visual cue. You know who my father was, right? Don't you? His name, his father's name, Edgethal, the Thal, 
means servant or slave. Edge of the sword. Servant of the sword. Now that's a pretty cool name for a warrior. It'd be like a warrior today being, yeah, my name's Kalishnikov's son. That's a good name for a... So, he says, we've come here with a friendly heart. Seeking your Lord, the son of Haftane, guardian of his people. Be of good counsel to us. We have a great mission. He goes, um, we've heard about the evildoer. Kind of channeling his inner George Bush. W. Bush, the other one. Evildoers. In the dark nights, etc., etc. He says, I've come with a generous spirit. I want to counsel Hrothgar. Counsel him how? Look at 278, 279. How the wise old king, he may... Overcome this fiend. He may, what's another way of looking at overcome this fiend? Okay, yeah, it does mean kill him. Go back to these lines. How he may expect comfort. How he may change what's been going on for the last 12 years. If a change should ever come for him, because it's almost like Beowulf siege. Whoosh, Went completely over the Coast Guard's head. So now he's going to speak in very normal language. A remedy for the evil of his afflictions. Right? Because how long has Hrothgar been evilly afflicted? Twelve years. Here, think of it this way. In Hrothgar's day, having Grendel come every night would be analogous for us today. Not us here. Us say in the United States. 9-11, 9-12, 9-13, 9-14, every day. Every day. Four, air, four airplanes hijacked. Three of them hitting major sites. Every day. When you think of 3,000 people out of a population of 330 million, yeah, that's probably like 30 men a night to Hrothgar. Every day day for 12 years. Just how many people are in that place? No idea. How crippled would government be? That gives you an idea of how crippled Hrothgar is. Keep in mind, earlier, what were we told about him? He was so fearsome, people gave tribute from far and wide to build this nice little house, his house, his hall. Now, he's reduced to what? Sitting on his butt going, woe is me. I can't do anything. So, or a remedy for the, for the evil of his afflictions and his seething cares turn cooler. <laughs> his seething cares, notice, they must be, if he's going to turn them cooler, they must be burning hot. Are those the fires in brace? Metaphorically, yeah, they are. And Beowulf says, I can turn them, I can turn the heat down a little bit. Or, if he doesn't want this, else forever afterwards, a time of anguish he shall suffer, his sad necessity, while there stands in its high place the best of houses. I can come and solve his problems, or he can live like this the rest of his life. The watchman says, you know, okay. A sharp shield, shield warrior must be a judge of both things, words and deeds. Sharp, the word that's translated sharp there means discerning. A discerning warrior has got to be able to determine what? Tell the difference between two things. Words, deeds. You might be a great talker. Doesn't mean you're a great doer, right? Think Presidential candidates. We've had presidential candidates who say great stuff. They get into office and they're horrible. Why? Because they can't do what they said they could do. He says, I think you're a doer. Good talker, but I think you can do the things you can say. So he tells them how to get to Rothgar's house. Fit five, line 320. The road was stone paved. Now, that's a bit of an anachronism. Why? First of all, where are they? 
They're on that little island between Denmark and Sweden. Okay. What time period? Sixth century, let's say. What were not there in the sixth century? Paved roads. Stone paved roads. Who in the ancient world paved stone roads? Romans. Rome hadn't gotten that far. Rome's advance stopped at the Rhine River. Famous battle. I've got a little book on it. The Battle That Stopped Rome. It's a great book. In like, I don't remember, 180 AD. I mean, they were just stopped cold. Right? So this is an anachronism. This is the Christian poet of whatever time period, I think it's later, I think it's 10th century, if not later, who is writing based upon his awareness of the world around him. And guess what? England, even in the 7th century, had Roman paved roads. You can actually walk on some of those roads today. You can go to... In Watling Street in London, you can't see the pavement there, but you can leave Watling Street and you can follow it. You can go out into the countryside and you can see those Roman cobblestones. Because they still knew ways to pave that we can't pave like they did. Which is why we're repaving roads every five years. The Romans didn't repave roads every five years. So, they go on. They meet a proud warrior. Later identified as Wolfgar. And he says, uh, who are you guys? <laughs> Where are you coming with all those swords and everything? He says, I'm Harold, servant of Hrothgar. I've never seen so many foreign men, fearless, bold, etc., etc." And Beowulf says, we are Helix, board companions. Board, we sit at the table with them. That means we are tight with Helix. We are his close companions. Okay? Beowulf is my name. Name drop. Yeah. Is it a name drop, though? Not yet, it's not. Because Beowulf, as far as we know at this point, has a name where? Only among the Geats, where he's the strongest of all men. Okay? He says, I, I, I want to tell Hrothgar what we're here for, but we're here to help, so... Hrothgar, uh, Wolfgar goes to Rothgar. Says there's some men, Helix men. They want to come talk to you about something. And the leader of them is a guy named Beowulf. Right? Let me give away something that we find out later in the poem. Prior to Beowulf arriving, the Danes and the Geats have been in conflict. They've not been in open warfare. It's been like the U.S.-Soviet Union Cold War. So to have geats land on your territory, uh, red flag warning, you know. So this guy goes, uh, yeah, some geats have landed on our territory. They want to talk to you. Their leader's named Beowulf. Hrothgar. Okay, 12 years have passed. We don't know how old Hrothgar is yet. That's going to come up later. But Hrothgar says, I knew him when he was nothing but a boy. His old father was called Edgedale. Well, okay, that tells us it's the same Beowulf, because Beowulf already said my father was named Edgedale, to whom Revel the Gate gave in marriage his only daughter. Now his daring son has come here, sought a loyal friend. See, fairs and truth have said to me, those who brought to the gates gifts and money as thanks, that he has 30 men's strength, strong in battle, in his hand grip. Okay. So, I knew him when he was a boy. Describe when he was a boy. What, what, does the, what is the age beyond which a male child is no longer called a boy? Probably 15. 15, maybe? In, Julie, in Shakespeare's Antony and Cleopatra, Julius Caesar gets really angry because Antony... Calls him something. And Caesar goes, he called me a boy. Well, Antony's in his late 40s. And Julius Caesar's in his early 20s. And I don't think that's what Hrothgar means here. I think he means somewhere between, you know, like maybe five. And at most, 15. 
Like 15, Germanic society in this day, that's old enough to be a warrior. So it's probably more like 10. So 5 to 10. When? When did Hrothgar know him as this? Well, he's going to tell us in a little while. He says, Hrothgar says, Beowulf is there, why? Holy God, in his grace, has guided him to us, to the West Danes, as I would hope, against Grindel's terror. Now, there's two problems with that speech. From within the perspective of the world of the poem, Hrothgar wouldn't say, one, holy God, if he were a good native Germanic pagan person, nor would he refer to God's grace. Because holy God, God here would be who? Odin. Odin wasn't known for being very gracious to people. Okay? Yeah, he'd wander around, wander around about them. It wasn't only Loki paying tricks on people. Odin would do some of that too. But the Germanic gods were not known for grace. For being gracious to people. Okay? So this is an element of the Christian poet's own belief system kind of, I would argue, leaking through. Because Hrothgar is not a Christian. It's pretty clear throughout the poem. No way he's a Christian. So, God has sent him. Well, that's the same language the poet, not the speaker of the poem, the poet used to describe who being sent to the Danes earlier. Shud Shevig. God looked down upon the Danes. They were leaderless. And Shud Shevig came as what? A foundling boy on a boat, we found out later. Beowulf comes on a boat. He is of sorts a foundling. His father is dead. We don't know his age at this point. So just as Shild Shevig kind of came as a deliverer, Beowulf is coming as a deliverer of sorts. Coming to deliver a change to those who don't expect any change, just as Shild Shevig did. See, this theme runs throughout the poem. So he says, I'll offer trade. Send him in. He can solve our problems. So notice what else Rothgar has told us. He not only knew Beowulf as a boy, but what else does he know? He's a strong warrior man. He's got the strength of 30 men. How has he heard that? Tales of seafarers. So Beowulf's stories have spread beyond just the land of the geese. So Beowulf is brought in, and... He speaks to Hrothgar. Was hail, Hrothgar. Was hail, be whole, be well. It's the same was hail as you will hear every now and then at Christmas time. Here we go, a wasseline among the leaves so green. Wasseline, later Middle Ages, loses the meaning was hail, be well. And it becomes a drink. But it is a drink for what purpose? It is a drink to your health. Okay? It means be whole, literally. Okay? So, I'm Helix Kinsman, young retainer. Young retainer in my youth. What's the difference between I'm a young retainer and in my youth? No. In my youth implies when I was younger. When I was younger. So is that like a year ago? So how long ago is it? My point, question or point I'm getting at is, how old is Beowulf now in the story? Because we're never told. 20 or 30? I think 20 or 30 is a little bit too long. 15, 16, 17, 18? Possibly. No, okay. I think he was more tiny. But, but we don't know. In my youth I have done many glorious deeds. So if he's younger than 20, then how old was he when he did glorious deeds? Because he's going to tell us what those deeds are. 
What are those deeds? They're his resume. <laughs> He's like saying, look, I'm a monster killer. <laughs> Let me show you the monsters I've killed. And he pulls out, you know, snapshots. He keeps them in his wallet in case he needs to prove it to anybody. So what did he do? I sought you out. Why? Because my friends, they themselves had seen me, bloodstained from battle, line 419, come from the fight. When I captured five, slew a tribe of giants. So I captured five tri giants, and I slew a whole tribe of them. Tribe, the word that's used there, it's kin, which is related to the word for genus, G-E-N-U-S, which has the first part of the word that you trap, put onto it, oside, and you get what? Genocide. He practiced genocide against a tribe of, he killed them all. What's this tell us about Beowulf? You don't want to mess with him. Okay? So, but I captured five, like for playthings. Think of a mouse and a cat. The cat does what with the mouse? Let's it get away and pounces again. So, on the salt waves, I fought sea monsters by night. I survived that tight spot. I avenged the waiter's affliction. You know, gloss footnote, what, what, what affliction was this? Sea monsters were bothering them. So, dial 1-800-BEOWULF to take care of your sea monster problem. They asked for it, you know. Crush those grim foes. He goes, and now I'll take on Grindel. From you now I wish, ruler of the bright names, to request a single favor, protector of the shieldings. Really? How protectorish of the shieldings has he been for 12 years? No, he was busy slaying sea monsters. And... No, 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 no. He's talking about Hrothgar. Hrothgar is the protector of the shieldings. Not been doing such a great job for 12 years. So, that I might alone Oh, what the hell? Oh, my own band of pearls? What line is that? That is line 431. I don't think I've ever noticed that. Okay, that is definitely a typo. I have no idea what the O there is supposed to be. That I might owe love. Maybe O as O-H? Could be, but he's not talking to his nobles there. He's talking like, I might alone one of my band of earls and this hardy troop cleanse Hera. Maybe it's supposed to be or. It can't be or. It would, whatever it is. Yeah, maybe it's of my own band of earls, but that's not in the Old English at all. Um, well, what does the Old English say in that line? 431. Now I thus have come from afar that I um, might alone, yeah, it's got to be of, mine earls uh, fight, my noble earls, because it's possessive, of my noble earls. That's what it should be. Okay. Um, cleanse her out. Okay. That's okay. I'll take care of this later. So. Does he say, I'll do this? I'll do it all alone? No. He says, let him put his faith, line 440, in the Lord's judgment whom death takes. That's let him whom death takes put his faith in the Lord's judgment. Let God decide. That's what Beowulf is saying. Is this a Christian God? No. The kind of God system, if you want, that you have here is monotheistic, though. It's kind of Old Testament-y. Okay? Single God, etc. I expect that if he's, if, if Grendel gets to win, he'll lead us, as he's often done. Therefore, you'll have no need to bury me. That's like to cover my head. Okay? But if anything is left over, send it back to Eli, you know, for a pro proper burial. And he talks about his coat of mail. It is 
The work of Wayland. Who is Wayland? Wayland is Vulcan in Rome. Hephaistos in Greek. He is the smith god. I have a coat of mail made by a god. Send that back to Heleth. You don't get to keep it if I die. <laughs> so, yeah. Hrothgar. For past favors, my friend Beowulf, and for old deeds you have sought us out. Notice, Beowulf said, I heard about your Grendel problem. I'm a monster killer. I'm here to take care of your monster problem. Hrothgar says, no, you're here for past favors, for past deeds. Well, what are those past favors and deeds? Hrothgar is going to tell us. Beowulf is there because Beowulf owes them, Hrothgar implies. Your father struck up the greatest of feuds when he killed Hedelaf by his own hand among the wildings. And that's a kind of a, a locus criticus. It means it's a, it's a critical crux. It's, it's a hole. Not really sure what the killed Hedelaf among the Wilvings means. Is it he killed Wilaf and all of the Wilvings among all the rest of them? Or is it he killed Wilaf, who was one of the Wilvings, sons of Wolf? Okay? Not quite sure. And then what happened? The Wader tribe wouldn't take him back. That is, the tribe he married into, because Edgedale is not a waiter. The waiters are the sons of um, Grethel the Gate. Okay, they're also, Geats are also called waiters. Um, they wouldn't take him back. Why? What did he just say? Edgedale started a feud. He opened a feud. And the waiter's going, we're not covering your sorry. No, leave. Not our fight. And Hrothgar gave him refuge. Okay. Is this when Hrothgar knew Beowulf as a boy? There's no other instance in the poem that tells us when he could have known Beowulf as a boy. I think it's got to be this. So, kind of deepens the plot a little bit. How long ago was this? Right? When the waiter tribe would not harbor him for fear of war, thence he sought the South Dane people over the billowing seas, the honor shieldings. Then I first ruled the Danish folk and held in my youth this grand kingdom. Ah, another little variable. So how old is Hrothgar? Well, how old? What's the very, very absolute base minimum Hrothgar has got to be? At least 12 years, right? Because <laughs> Grendel's been coming for 12 years. And Hrothgar commanded the hall be built before then. But what did he do before he commanded the hall be built? He achieved greatness in arms. He attracted a huge following. So he can't attract greatness of arms if he is only five years old. He had to be at least 20. So now we're at least 38 years. So if he knew Beowulf being a boy, and it was at the beginning of his reign, maybe it wasn't the literal beginning of his reign, maybe it was a year into his reign, 37 years. And Beowulf was five years old then. That means Beowulf's 32. So that when we get to the end of the poem, Beowulf is minimum. 82, not counting how long Helak reigned after Beowulf goes back at the end of this, and how long his son reigned. Okay? All kinds of little questions. So, we'll stop with this. What is Hrothgar really saying You're here about to pay a debt. you are here to pay a debt? That's exactly right. You owe me, buddy. Because you're alive, because I saved your father's life. Why does Rothgar do that? Is he just a dirty, rotten, ungrateful SOB? So that he doesn't have to pay uh, for, you know. Okay, possibly, but what has he already said? 
<laughs> Let him in. I'll give him treasures if he can stop the Grendel infestation. What else? Honesty. He's just feeling emasculated. Honesty? Is it because he's feeling a little bit emasculated? What did the one guy say? Man, you are the greatest Earl on earth. And Rothko's going, you know, what am I? Swiss cheese? <laughs> or Danish, you know. <laughs> cheese. Or what's the other possibility? There are numerous possibilities. Okay. All right, we will pick up with um, about line 470. So we're only what? 100,000 some lines behind? <laughs> Just a little over 1,000. Well, we uh, yeah, let's go ahead and maybe. Uh, so plan for, plan for a quiz. And will the quiz still cover 